quiz on the reading. Um, the topic is corneal transplantation. It's a really big chapter. good, important um, kind of pearls. So the questions are, number one, which of the following past medical histories will allow use of potential donor cornea for transplant? So another way to is which would not. <laughs> okay, number two, Need more time. We're going to go over the answers. So, <clears throat> post op complications in pediatric PK would include glaucoma, amblyopia, slow or delayed healing, graft rejection. Pick all of the following except which of those? A little bit of a slightly tricky question. I'm not going to read this part. According to the cornea donor study, how did donors over 66 or under 66 compared to donors over 66 years of age? Higher rate of graft, early graft failure at five years, no difference in rate of graft failure at five years, lower rate of graft failure at five years, higher rate of late graft failure at five years. I wouldn't know this unless you read about this. <clears throat> Based on keratoscopy, which is just what, this is a placido image, right? This is what standard topography is generated from. That's just a computer analysis. Which suture would you take out? 80, 170, 260, 350. There could be more than one right answer. But Which of the following types of rejection is most detrimental to long-term survival? Epithelial, or endothelial? This patient presents with increased irritation of his eye. What is the best management? Repeat. Yeah, it's a dark, but so it's a transplant, the sutures, you can see that the eye is red. And then this line is kind of what you're supposed to be looking at. If you could see better, there would be some edema below that line. And so like that, again, could be a board's question and you would you try to elucidate. You'd say, well, I think, you know, this is what I know and this is what it could be and oral boards maybe. So you could repeat the transplant, increase the pred drops to every hour, Increase the print to three times a day, culture, and start fortified antibiotics. Where would you place a PI to prevent pupillary block after endothelial keratoplasty, superior temporal, inferior, or nasal? Think about how fluid circulates. Probably all know this, but and then also the patient's going to be upright, and there's going to be an air bubble. Those are the clues. Um, which type of refractive shift would you see after DSEC? Myopic, hyperopic, or no refractive shift? Not intuitive, you wouldn't know unless you read. Patient had a history of three failed transplants and two in the right eye and two in the left eye. <clears throat> he also has a long-term hospitalization after taking Bactrim, which would be the next, the best Next, best step, I can't talk. Repeat, or penetrating keratoplasty and DSEC, thesis or DMEC. This could be a board's question. Which of the following does not increase the risk of rejection? Larger graft size, older recipient age, presence of peripheral anterior synechia, or a loose suture? Which of the following past medical histories will allow the use of potential donor cornea use for transplant? 
not a very good question, Manny. Bad wording. We'll have to. <laughs> So breast cancer, it's okay. Even metastatic cancer, as long as it's not to the eye, is okay for transplant. Leukemia, active septicemia, it's kind of obvious you would want to potentially transplant bacteria or, you know, um, grossly <coughs> cancerous cells into an eye. And leukemia, the cells can circulate and get into the eye tissue. Parkinson's disease is kind of an interesting one. Most people don't feel like Parkinson's disease is transmissible, but it is on the list of, um, you know, it's more probably in the, people would not, it, there's no known transmission of Parkinson's disease, let's put it that way, but it is on a list of exclusions, so. There's a fair amount of eye banking in this chapter. We won't go into a lot of it, but we'll go into some really basic stuff. So, Kids heal fast. Sometimes you can take their stitches out. Literally, you can have all the stitches out in a penetrating keroplasty in three weeks. I've done that before. And all, you know, three weeks, the tissue would fall out. All of the others are actually higher risk for pediatric cornea transplant. The cornea donor study was a big center trial. I was actually one of the investigators. And it compared donor tissue from younger and older donors. And the correct answer was there's no difference in graft failure um, And there was about an 80, 80, well, 86% uh, survival rate of transplants. And 10, I mean, younger tissue, it's kind of intuitive. Younger tissue may be a little better, but really this was a very important study to kind of validate the use of older donor tissue, which is obviously a higher supply because older people pass away. So it was really helped for surgeons to be able to be accepting of using older corneas, not just looking for young trauma victims or unfortunately we see a lot of suicide victims. So which suture would you take out? The one where the Myers are most flattened. One opposite could be a correct answer because you do have a coupling. We aren't going to really talk about that this year, but in the refractive surgery lectures of the alternate year, we talk about that. So if you took this suture out here, you would actually see a lot of effect overall, probably, but taking this one out where it's most flattened is the correct one. That will be on OCAPs and boards. I mean, it just will be, it always is. Endothelial rejection, obviously, endothelial cells don't regenerate, so that's the most important type of rejection to prevent. Um, this is a cutaduced line, not a very easy one to see, but you'd want to increase the topical steroids to hourly, and you could do other things, but that's the best answer. Inferior peripheral erotomy, um, so that fluid can circulate, the air will be on top, fluid can circulate around through the iris to help prevent um, pupillary block. If you don't understand that at a more junior level, don't worry about it because it will be, it's something that you'll, you'll understand. Um, you get hyperopic shift with DSEC surgery. Um, it has something to do with kind of a maybe minus lens on the, just the maybe the kind of the shape of the tissue. No one really knows exactly why that is. We published a paper on it with some kind of ray tracing suggestions, but we don't really know for sure. But generally, it's hyperopic. You can get any, but if this were a test question, you would say hyperopic. Um, three failed transplants in the right eye, two in the left. And then this implies what any resident Hospitalization, this person was in the burn unit after taking a sulfa drug. What did they get have? What was it? A yes. They um, would have very poor ocular surface, so likely the ceases. And the prognosis would be crappy for that, too. So, 
not a, the answer, best answer might be none. So older recipient age actually is associated with less rejection because the recipient immune system is weaker, so you're less likely to reject. So now we're just going to move into the lecture. So why would we do, and this says for PK, but also could apply to some of the other cornea transplants, particularly lamellar, anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Um, the most obvious reason is that the patient can't see and there's something in the way. So a visual or optical reason, it could be an actual scar that's blocking the vision, or it could be a deficit in the curvature of the cornea that can't be overcome by a contact lens. So severe thinning, severe irregular astigmatism. Um, things like edema obviously would also block vision. Structural refers more to that shape part, um, or could, re could refer to uh, patient with trauma or infection, perforation, that kind of thing. But um, number two is related to number one because if you don't have a good structural cornea, you usually don't see very well. And then therapeutic is <clears throat> the least commonly performed, but would be for an infection that can't be controlled. That you need your goal. Maybe I can cut this out before it spreads. Um, and then sometimes just tectonic to. Uh, you know, restore the globe, but it may be a temporary thing um, as well. So perforations, things like that, which are, you know, rheumatoid melt would be a good example of something where you're just going to have to do a patch graft and then try to do a definitive repair later. So this just shows a variety of indications. I'll, I won't quiz you guys, but slip beam showing thickness, that's herpetic Stromal edema, you would get, you would calm that down before you. So this is a classic discoform herpetic edema. You would calm that down. Um, you wouldn't do a transplant if they had that active edema. Fuchs dystrophy with gute, obviously perforation, keratoconus or pellucid, granular dystrophy, herpes simplex, um, all kinds of, you know, this could be interstitial keratitis or infection. Failed graft is a very common one. Um, this would be more of a possible therapeutic indication. Um, I'm not even sure what that is. It's probably an infection. But I mean, there's all kinds of different reasons. Um, so just a little bit about eye banking. Um, the book says 2 to 75, and I think that's fairly... Each eye bank has its own acceptable criteria, but that's pretty standard. Um, again, the cornea donor study helped um, justify and validate using older tissue. Um, cell count, most people use a higher cell count than 2,000, but that's kind of what is uh, written in the EBAA, I Bank Association of America Standards. Um, we generally use tissue over about 2,300 cells in our iBank. I feel like we have a, a surplus of tissue. And then for endothelial keratoplasty, because there's so much manipulation, we usually use a little bit higher cell count, 2,500. And so as a surgeon, you can kind of specify to your eye bank what your own criteria are within reason. Death preservation is really, the, the standard is really 12 hours, but most of the time, most eye banks go out to 24 hours if the body is not too warm. And many, many people die in the hospital or in the might be transported to the coroner's office. So very common practice, you guys might have seen this, rotating on medicine or whatever, to put the ice in gloves and close the eyes and put the, you know, the ice over the eyelids. And that's the idea there is to help preserve the corneal tissue. So usually out to 24 hours is totally fine. You know, if somebody passed away out in Death Valley in the summer and it was 19 hours, you probably would not use their tissue because the heat just, you know, speeds up all of the enzymatic degradation of the tissue. Um, there are different storage media. The book goes into this a little bit. <clears throat> um, we don't use organ culture in this country, but you should know about it. Um, the, uh, you know, the common way of storage here is cold storage. Might be good to know that the temperature ranges, you know, you 
don't want to freeze the tissue. There are a couple different preservation media. Um, preservation media, I don't know that that would be a really important thing to memorize, but GS stand for gentamicin and streptomycin, so it has antibiotics in it, it has some nutrients in it. Um, there was another study that, again, I was a, an investigator in called the Cornea Preservation Time Study, which was a DSEC study that proved that it really was safe and effective to use tissue out to 14 days, although the corneas really did the best when they were used by 11 days. So that's kind of my preferred. We had a cornea last week or the week before this. Which is doing fine. So we still use them. But, and that was in response to surgeons not wanting to use the tissue after that. Thinking is one area where there have really been some good prospective studies to help surgeons understand what you know, what's advisable or, or clinically um, appropriate. So um, the required testing is HIV, hepatitis B and C, and RPR. And there are other tests, for example, California requires testing for HTLV 1 and 2. Um, we had a donor recently, Maddie again, uh, organ donors are tested for CMV and EBV, and often those titers are positive, and we still accept the tissue. They just want to know for their organ donor patients. So, um, things like Zika, um, I don't know. I don't think Zika has been transmitted by corneal transplantation, but that is a really important, you know, recent infection where people might not be sick. <clears throat> they might be past the you know the, the sick phase of the illness, but still be able to pass it. So, fortunately, the Zika thing kind of died off. I'm not aware of any, but you can kind of foresee other infections. West Nile virus is another one that people can get and maybe not know that they have, which could be could be important and detrimental to a at-risk recipient. It tells you what diseases people have transmitted. AIDS has not been transmitted no known transmission, hepatitis B has, C probably, um, rabies. Interestingly, when I was in practice in Idaho, the guy, I was only in private practice for two years before I came back here, but the guy whose practice I took over was the first guy to report a death from a rabies donor. His patient died from malconia transplant from somebody who had died from rabies. So, so that wasn't really known then was the first case. So that was, that was awful, obviously. So when we're looking at the tissue in the eye bank, we look at it with the microscope, look for all these things, pretty obvious, then we do blood work. Um, the social and medical history is really important. I'm not going to go into that, but the book kind of talks about it again. That's maybe not as important as some of the other stuff in the, but for example, people who've been incarcerated or, or are very promiscuous, you know, we, we don't use the tissue. And most of this screening is done via a coordinator over the phone with a family member or sometimes with a physician. And, so, and it doesn't talk at all about new consent, but in Utah, most of you probably have Utah driver's licenses. You know, there's a registry, and so there's an implied consent law. Um, consent from the family is not required in many, many states now if the person has signed up to be a donor. Now, as a kind of a nicety, the, you know, the donation coordinators will usually try to verify that with the family, make, it, make sure everybody's on board. But, but if the person signs up for it, they, they can legally take the tissue. <clears throat> so one of the most important things that's not really emphasized in this chapter is when you're thinking about doing a transplant, just think about the whole patient. You know, we have two eyes. Many times you can't restore perfect function to the eye in question. So if you do a lot of complex surgery and try to make them better, is it still going to be kind of a crappy eye compared to their good eye? That's a really important consideration. I cannot overemphasize this. Afferent pupillary defect. Uh, many times you cannot see the pupil, but you can still do a subjective afferent or reverse afferent test. I get referred so many people that are blind from glaucoma that they have cloudy cornea and you're like, well, we have we had one last week that we didn't have serious retinal problems. We didn't have very high hopes that um, that he would restore 
have his vision restored based on testing. And then chart review is really helpful to try to figure out, um, mostly for glaucoma and retinal disease, and you can kind of try to go back if you get old records, kind of see if they could see a few years ago and you know kind of what's been going on since, and that's really helpful in my opinion. So you want to do a little detective work. Um, <clears throat> you have to pay attention to what else is going on in the eye, particularly glaucoma surgery, really important. Um, if you're going to change or remove an IOL, you got to think about is it scarred in there, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty common sense stuff. Um, if you're going to do IOL surgery, how do you do IOL calculations? If you're going to do a cornea transplant, that is for another day, but basically you have to estimate the curvature of the new cornea. Um, sometimes if they have really bad, we had a patient just recently with really bad, well, it was last week also, really bad um, edema on his cornea, so we couldn't get any um, K values at all. So we kind of estimated from the other eye. You know, they, they kind of look back and say, well, your two eyes were pretty similar. Sometimes you just have to, could because it was a combined DMEC and FACO. Um, you really have to plan ahead. You have to know all your equipment that you might need. Think of plan A, B, and C when you're it's nice to have an assistant, even if it's a scrub nurse who can kind of help, you know, sometimes if they're working more, a more emergent situation or something, just, just kind of help and know what's going on. Um, ultrasound is really useful. If you have an opaque cornea, you can see how thick and nasty that cornea is, but, you know, there's a choroidal effusion, the lens is right up against, right up in the front of the eye. This person has an RD. So we're, we're very spoiled to have Dr. Harry here. Um, but even if you do your own EZN, you usually find really, you know, bad stuff that may maybe need to be addressed either during surgery or possibly even as a contraindication for surgery. Um, the criteria for success for corneal transplantation is very dependent on the pre-morbid diagnosis or pre pre-surgery diagnosis. So, for example, Stevens-Johnson syndrome would have a horrible prognosis and keratoconus would have a great prognosis. So, and then there's a whole spectrum in between. Recipient age is really one of the things that is um, perhaps counterintuitive, but generally the older the recipient, the better they do. Because again, they don't have such a strong immune system. Um, but all of these other things can factor in, and I would just really, really, really emphasize this one. Patients with poorly controlled ocular surface disease do not do penetrating keroplasty or anterior lamellar keroplasty. With EK, they do better, and pretty much all old people in Utah have dry eye, so you got to kind of think about that and try to control it. That's usually one of the biggest uphill battles. It's not rejection, it's not, it's just trying to get the ocular surface rehabbed. Compliance also is huge, 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 huge. <clears throat> um, anesthetic, generally, uh, we do mostly blocks, but also general anesthesia, nothing fancy there. Um, certain types of surgery, namely EK, can, can be done with topical anesthesia, very effective. But I wouldn't want to do a penetrating keratoplasty with topical anesthesia um, just because the eye can squeeze and move and you're more likely to have the expulsion of contents. So. so we'll do a couple little videos of operative technique. Hopefully this plays. Um, so that was a keratoconus patient, so we cauterized to flatten the anterior profile of the cornea so that the tree fine cuts more vertically. Um, Maddie, what do you hear in your head when you're at this step? Scissors vertical. Yeah, try to keep the scissors vertical, kind of hug the wall where the tree fine is. Um, we use viscoat. We talk a lot about um, tissue distribution. You can already kind of see that this tissue kind of fits in the hole well. 
that's one of the goals, especially with keratoconus, you want to flatten the profile of the cornea. Um, so again, really the first two sutures and the, and the first four kind of determine where that tissue is going to be. So simple interrupted um, running sutures are also used. That was pretty fast transport. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, just to kind of go through the steps more, um, sometimes a fixation ring can be used. Maddie, what have you learned about how to suture the fixation ring? Like get a partial bite in the uh, And to have it so loose, right? Yeah. Because you don't really want to create a lot of astigmatism. But the idea is, I don't know if you, any of you have seen the eye collapse. Probably in retina surgery you see it. You know, sometimes if you drain, you're doing a buckle or whatever. But, you know, you don't want the eye to collapse. So. If you have that kind of scaffolding on there, at least you'll have some structure. But it's the eye can just it can just turn inside out almost. It's really nasty. So having a this is called a McNeil Goldman ring. It's uh, incorporated into the lid speculum, but we often use what, what's called a floating ring. And we this is like Dacron suture, but we usually use silk. Um, handheld tree fine, but most of the time we use suction tree fines. Um, entering, we enter inflate with visco. Uh, one important thing on the cutting is to again try not to leave a ledge. So most of the time the tree fine will bevel out just a little bit. So if you have the dome of the cornea, the tree fine's going to bevel out a little bit. So if you're not careful to get your blade of your scissor in the groove that's already established, you're going to leave a rim. And so I always say hug the outer wall. So you get your blade of your scissor in there and you're kind of coming down and then you're just kind of pushing centripetally a little bit to try to get that get the blade. suturing is just something that is fairly straightforward um, but it's good to practice so you guys should all practice on styrofoam you don't need an eye bank eye styrofoam works great just practice passing angles um, we would all, again offer to all of you the uh, microscope out at Mid Valley in the minor room on the first floor. It's just like our microscope, foot pedal, everything. So it's a really good place to practice. Okay. Um, so this just shows a combination of running and interrupted sutures, just different ways of suturing. So intraoperative complications, I was kind of, I thought it was interesting in the book, they kind of minimize the most dreaded complication or don't really discuss it that much, which is what, Maddie? Supercroidal hemorrhage. I mean, that is horrible if you get it because it's usually blinding. So um, as you get into, you know, kind of cornea rotations and whatever, we can talk about how to help minimize that. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. Um, this is important for you guys because you take call. So the early post-op care, um, you see these patients, unfortunately, I apologize for that, but, you know, they might have pressure issues or they could have, you know, it seems like abrasions are common or, you know, there could be pain or what have you. But if you kind of just follow these principles, you know, then you're, the first stages are really to get that barrier function back to make sure the eye's not leaking, make sure the epithelium's intact. And one thing to really remember is try to avoid too aggressive um, topical medications. Many of these patients are on glaucoma medications. For example, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are pretty, pretty toxic to the surface. So if you're trying to promote epithelialization, you might even want to stop their COSOPT for a week and, you know, watch their pressure closely, that kind of thing. Um, obviously pressure, pressure is a really a huge thing and many transplant patients, many, many, many of these patients have glaucoma and it's usually complex, so that's important. <coughs> um, don't forget about the macula. A lot of patients with IOL problems or other complications that cause corneal problems will have either acute or chronic macular edema. It's amazing what OCT can pick up preoperatively, even through cloudy cornea. So somebody comes in with kind of a cloudy cornea and you're like, yeah, your endothelium is bad, but your vision's really horrible. It's good to get an OCT. And I picked up CME many, many, many times. And you can still treat them and just know you're <coughs> aggressive on steroids and what have you. 
<clears throat> this just emphasizes that you want to try to get the cornea. Um, I thought this was funny. It popped up on my, just one of those spontaneous random things, a backward d -sec. And I just took a picture of it because I thought that was, it never, I don't know if they have kind of a random thing, but it, it came up. So I thought that was cool. 2050 line. Um, so in the middle phase, which would be, I would consider that, you know, somewhere between one month and two months out to maybe six months out, you're just trying to um, make the astigmatism less, maybe get the patient into glasses or a contact. You're starting to taper your immunosuppression. You're starting to take sutures out. And usually the patient's on cruise control, control unless they get stuck in the eye by a um, laundry basket and rupture their eye at day 10, like one of our recent patients, who is now a phakic, but seeing 2025 with her scleral lens, so she's doing all right. Um, anyway, eye protection, enough said. Um, and then late care, really one of the most important thing is just um, trying to decide what to do with immunosuppression, you know, we a lot of that. I really think having been in practice for 25 years now and seen all different styles of managing transplant patients, if you see your patients more often and you keep them on a little bit of steroid, they do better. The rejection rate is definitely lower on low dose steroid, but also just compliance. I mean, people can, um, and, and Kind of compliance implies that you need to see them too. The doctor needs to put forth effort to keep seeing their patients. We usually see them every six months or every year, but part of the visit is just saying, wow, you know, if your eye gets blurry for a few days or if it gets a little red or light sensitive, you need to call us and come in because many, many rejections can be reversed um, if caught early and their death to the transplant if they're not caught. And it's kind of like macular degeneration. You know, people have two eyes, maybe it's not their preferred eye anyway, so they're just gonna kind of ignore it. So really educating the patient is important. Um, prevention of a problem is much easier than fixing it in most cases. So there's all kinds of reasons that graphs can fail. We'll kind of scoot through some of this. Um, <clears throat> and I've seen this multiple times where, um, you know, the patient's IOL is kind of hanging out of their eye. This isn't actually my patient, this is a file photo, but um, there, this is probably the most common blinding complication of um, corneal transplantation is trauma, with glaucoma being probably a close second. Um, but all of these other things are important. Cataracts are fixable. Rejection, you know, depending on when you catch it. Um, the book says endophthalmitis is much more common than cataract surgery. I don't know that that's actually true because, you know, endophthalmitis rates for cataract surgery vary a lot. But I've seen some studies saying endophthalmitis after corneal transplantation is at as high as 2%. And, you know, that could be in India where there's lots of, you know, awfulness and there are lots of, you know, in the U.S. it's not that high. But, <clears throat> you know, if you're in ophthalmitis rate for cataract surgery is 0.1%, then probably just based on volume, endophthalmitis is more common. I don't, knock on wood, I've never had a patient with endophthalmitis in 25 years. Um, you know, I've had patients with suture abscess get endophthalmitis years out, but it's uncommon. Yeah? What are your thoughts on rim cultures? Um, rim cultures, the EBAA recommends them. I don't perform them routinely, Dr. Lynn does. Um, and, you know, they give a lot of erroneous information. And so it's hard because we don't sterilize the eye when we do surgery anyway, but rim cultures are thought to be useful just in case you get a bad infection, then you maybe have, you know, a head start. Um, fungal endophthalmitis with EK is really the pertinent issue because, you know, if somebody has candida on their rim culture and they, they're getting endophthalmitis, and that's probably where it would be 
be helpful in kind of making it for earlier diagnosis of a fungal infection as opposed to a super, super rare in the West. Anyway, you know, we just don't get as many. Oh, yes. No, no problem. Solely related to the steroid use, or is that something? It's else? you know a lot of it is just their pre-transplant state because many many patients have other complications which give them secondary glaucoma, and many many patients their glaucoma surgery has given them a failed cornea. So, but you know even though it's kind of not directly related to the transplant, that is like you get really frustrated when you're. You've done this beautiful surgery and you put a nice clear window on the eye and then they're blind from glaucoma because their pressure was 17 and you weren't really thinking about it and you were kind of managing their transplant. And so that's the point. It's like you just really need to, once you kind of get through those, you know, first few months, you really need to think about, okay, what else is going to blind this person? Trauma for sure. So eye protection, glaucoma is a close second. Um, so... And, and that is just, again, it's not really, if you're seeing your patients, you're gonna recognize steroid responder issues. Um, these patients, you know, sometimes you'll get somebody and their pressure's just 40 after you do a transplant. You gotta keep them on steroid, you have them on lodopredinol. You know, they're not rejecting, but you can't go lower. You know, they just need to send them, they get a two, gets their pressure down to 22, they're on, three drops and they're fine usually. <clears throat> but there are those instances. And then there are certainly instances where the high pressure is just not recognized for whatever reason. You know, you may have a patient where you can't check pressure very well or, you know, non-compliance or what have you. So, um, but I, I just would say that personally, for me, that is like one of my, one of the things that I really hate is when I haven't been aggressive enough on somebody's glaucoma lost their central vision because of it. Uh, measurement of glaucoma parameters after cornea transplant can sometimes be difficult. You know, if they don't have a great surface, you may not get great pictures for your RNFL. So sometimes they can't see well enough to do a great visual field. Checking pressure itself can be a little more difficult sometimes in these patients with sutures in, etc. Um, corneal thickness can be a factor. Um, cataracts is pretty obvious. Uh, one thing that's really, again, Maddie can harp on, you can give a person a cataract <clears throat> with fairly uncomplicated surgery just by not being gentle with the lens. And so I always tell my helpers, you know, squirt the saline back towards the iris, not towards the center of the eye like we're always used to doing. You have to be kind of careful when the eyes open not to push too much on the Lens, but generally most of the cataracts after transplant are caused by steroids. And the rate is not actually that high comparatively to like if you compared it to vitrectomy surgery or something like that would be anywhere close. Uh, many, many, many patients get cornea transplants in their 20s and don't get cataracts until their 60s despite being on a drop a day of prednisolone for life. Um, graft rejection, there was quite a bit in the book about graft rejection. I don't know why that picture didn't copy, but this is supposed to be subepithelial infiltrates. Um, and that's supposed to be an epithelial rejection line. And those are KP. And I won't, I mean, rejection is pretty straightforward. You can kind of learn about it. One thing, again, the book, and this is kind of propagated in the literature, if you, epithelial rejection, I'm not sure is even a real thing because the donor epithelium usually dies off and the recipient epithelium should push it out eventually. But subepithelial infiltrates, there's kind of a thought that those don't need to be treated. Usually they will progress into a more serious rejection. So if you see somebody with subepithelial infiltrates, um, then you should probably bump up their steroid a little bit. You 
you don't need to like do hourly pred like the question, but you know, you might want to, if they're on once a day, you might want to put them on twice a day and have them come back in three weeks. Um, so steroids, just kind of know basically the categories. Um, many patients don't need much steroid, even fluoromethylone, which is, it's a strong steroid, but doesn't penetrate the eye well, is, you know, one drop a day will often enough to prevent rejection. Um, Durazole is stronger than prednisolone or dexamethasone, um, but we don't, I don't use it as much just because it tends to be a little bit more expensive. Pred's pretty cheap. Prednisolone acetate is what we use on most patients. Lodopredinol is a great drug. There is a 1% lodopredinol now, but it's a little more expensive, but that's a really good drug. Medium strength steroid, much lower incidence of steroid responder, elevated pressure. Um, so I didn't really talk at all about, back to that other slide, HSV or zoster prophylaxis, but we generally keep our, anybody who has those diseases, we keep them on oral acyclovir or, you know, uh, similar for at least three months after surgery, sometimes a year, because you're having them on a lot of steroids and you may cause recurrence of the disease. Um, so this is just some reasons that grafts fail. Dislocated DSEC, swollen button. This is also a DSEC with a fluid cleft, so it's not attached. Um, I don't know what that is, just showing microcystic and stromal edema, failed PK. Um, suture problems, all kinds of suture problems, including a suture abscess leading to, a, in this case, a pseudomonas ulcer and loss of the graft. Um, I have had two patients, well, one patient, and not that long ago, lost her eye due to a suture abscess, which became, uh, it was kind of chronic, she didn't really come in. This was my patient, I did her transplant. She, she lives out of town, she's very, compliant patient but was treated by local doctors and unrecognized uh, fungal infection and she lost her eye unfortunately so that was only a couple of years ago so you got to manage these degrading sutures um, so we already talked about astigmatism a little bit what about wound healing I mentioned in babies you can take them out really early kind of want to take them out before you get a lot of vascularization because vascularization can bring blood vessels to the new donor tissue and bring the immune system to the donor tissue. So blood vessels in general are a reason to take sutures out. You have to balance that with the risk of trauma. You know, if you have a young active person, sometimes you want to keep the sutures in a little bit longer. Um, Sutures are a risk factor for rejection, even if they're not loose, because they're a little bit of an immune stimulus. So even if they're not vascularized or loose, I usually would rather have a patient on some steroid if they still have sutures in. Um, this is hugely important because sometimes you take that one or two last sutures out and they go from two diopters of astigmatism to 12, and then you need to do a wound revision. So sometimes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If they're seeing and functioning, you, you like to leave the sutures in. So you have all these kind of balancing acts of how to manage sutures. And then the most important one is once they start to break, you just gotta get them out because they can cause really bad complications. Um, all different kinds of contacts. We often use soft bandage contact lenses early in healing. They improve comfort and promote epithelialization. Scleral lenses are awesome. Um, even a regular gas permeable contact could be used as soon as one month after a um, cornea transplant. And if you guys ever work with me, you just know that I hate hybrid lenses, so don't ever suggest a hybrid lens because I'll just like delete it from Epic. But they're just horrible. I mean, in the age of sclera, either an RGP or a scleral lens, hybrid lenses just cause a lot of hypoxia. They're particularly bad in transplants because get vascularization of their limbus and their rim. They don't want that. Uh, let's see what else. Oops, wrong clicker. Um, you can do refractive surgery on cornea transplant patients. Um, we don't do LASIK much anymore, but PRK works fairly well. The patients don't really hold that well sometimes. 
but you can get rid of lots of nearsightedness and astigmatism. Um, and I definitely have patients that are 20, 20 ish years out from a PRK after uh, either a penetrating or deep anterior lamellar transplant. Um, cataract surgery is really an ace up our sleeve in many patients to, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of get rid of large spherical or sometimes even astigmatic refractive errors. Um, and, you know, we do use Torix a fair amount on transplant patients if their sutures are out and their astigmatism is manageable. Um, what else? You know, you just have to do a really careful FACO. And I always use Visco and I use a soft shell technique. So if you don't know what that is, you'll learn it when you get to cataract surgery. But you squirt the Visco in there, which is a dispersive OVD, and you, then you put ProVisc in duovisc and the provisc comes out really easy when you fake o, but you just you can you inject a blob of it and it just pushes a layer of visco up against the cornea so then when the the cohesive ovd comes out and i know some of this is over you guys have said so don't worry but the more senior you are the more you'll understand you still have a nice layer of visco in there to protect the donor tissue so that's called a soft shell tissue. Tube shunts are better than traps just because you don't get hypotony and flat chambers and stuff as much. So. But you have to be careful to keep the tube in good position. And our glaucoma surgeons are great at getting the tube in a good position. Um, I won't go into this too much. There's the safety glasses. Um, you can do EK after PK. This is just a picture of a patient who's had EK. You can see the EK in this case DSEC inside the old PK wound and you know it works great. So I often call it a retread um, but you can also do other surgeries you can do K-Pro. Um, sometimes the, the eye doesn't have much potential but they have a failed graft and other issues where you might do a conjunctival flap or all kinds of other things. Um, sometimes when a graft fails we just keep it as a we know that the eye has potential but it might be an uphill battle in trying to get graft again, so we just kind of manage it medically and keep it as a spare tire, knowing that it can be rehabilitated if they need it. And that happens a lot in transplant patients. You have one, you know, quite good eye and one not so good eye, and it's just like uphill battle to try to keep that eye with a clear transplant. But as long as you manage their pressure and things like that, you can say, well, we could do it again. And then sometimes when they're older, they do better. So, um, just little eye banking stuff. We can use LASIK tissue um, for uh, EK, which is nice because there are a lot of refractive recipients. I'm just going to go through some slides. Obviously, a dendrite. The disease can recur in the graft. Uh, another broken suture. Um, kind of vascularization along sutures. I want to get the suture out. Um, another kind of suture vascularization with some thinning and this is crystalline keratitis in a graft patient which the book mentions you know, strep viridans is fairly common um, you can kind of sit on these and just treat them and many times if you have them on Vanco for a long time they'll go away Vanco on a little steroid but it's a little scary <clears throat> Sometimes when you see something like that, you're like, oh, i got to take this graft out and replace it, do a therapeutic keroplasty. But most of the time, you can clear it medically. Just a suture abscess, um, broken running suture, probably an interrupted suture there too, wound dehiscence. Uh, Maddie, we've done at least one wound revision, right? It's amazing how easy you can cut into a cornea transplant wound and get it to open up. So it's not surprising that you see these patients on call with dehist corneas. So again, eye protection. Um, even DALC patients can get dehiscence pretty easy. They're just graft failures. Um, the book talks a little bit about vascularization. Certainly that is a risk factor for um, rejection. If this person, you can see there's some edema there. If this person had a repeat transplant. You, you know, you would kind of worry about this angriness over here, and maybe try to calm that down with lots of topical steroids. 
before repeating the graft. Um, you can use other modalities. You can use EGF inhibitors. You can use laser. But generally, corticosteroids work the best. You just slam them with topical steroids, and the blood vessels will often regress. Um, KP injection, a bimodal codidose line, KP. This one has everything. I think it has subepithelial infiltrate, codidose line, KP, um, subepithelial infiltrates. This quote epithelial rejection, but I'm not sure that it really is. Um, that's another quote epithelial rejection. Just failed graft with stromal edema. Another bunch of failed grafts. Perforation from recurrent herpes, patch graft. So just a quick word about, because um, I want to get to EK, we can use a femtosecond laser to cut our donor and, re and recipient tissue. Not really better than traditional methods, but it's kind of cool. I've done it on several patients. Just adds expense. K-Pro, we're not going to really talk about that, but it's a PMMA um, button. You can kind of see there, kind of screwed into a rim of a donor cornea and then sutured onto the eye. Glaucoma is really the main problem with these, but you can also get infection or uh, melting. Um, this is just, I'm not going to talk about that because we talked about an ocular surface reconstruction. This is a grainy video. I couldn't find a short, um, this is a DALC. I couldn't find a short DALC. So I had to go to this really old video. You can see it says Infinity Cataract Machine. I think it's been like 15 years since we've had an Infinity Cataract Machine. But, so this is a keratoconus patient. Um, so for deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, as you read about in the book, um, endothelial rejection is not a problem. So it's a really good surgery for um, young, young patients who need cornea transplants. So you do a, a trephination, a lamellar dissection. You want to take off about maybe 50% or a little bit less. And then the idea is you, this is a paracentesis to put some, to relieve the pressure a little bit. And then I'm just making a track. I'm trying to be as close to the top of uh, decimates without perforating, and then I'm going to inject air. That's just air in the anterior chamber for an indicator. And you'll see in a second here when we get the big bubble that you're pushing decimates back with air, and so those bubbles in the AC will kind of they'll peripheralize, I guess, and they'll move out. <coughs> and you can kind of see the anterior chamber bubbles kind of move peripherally, so you know that you've actually achieved your big bubble. Um, <clears throat> it's not as easy as it looks. I would say my success rate is only 50% probably in getting the big bubble. Most of the time the fellows are doing the cases. If I did them all myself, it'd probably be a little bit higher, but even so, so with, like internationally when I go, I see maybe two thirds of the time. But you can do lamellar dissections in um, anterior lamellar keratoplasty. That was just um, putting the viscoat on there was just so the air bubble wouldn't escape so fast when I cut through that last layer of stroma. This is like the most nerve wracking surgery when you're, all you have is decimase membrane and you're trying to cut off the residual stroma without popping decimase. So, but it's, it's really a cool surgery when you get it all cleaned off. You have just this beautiful, clear, so less chance of endothelial rejection. Um, it's kind of thought initially that maybe these eyes are stronger, but I don't think they really are. Um, maybe if you do lamellar dissection where you just leave a thin lamellae of stroma. Um, sometimes with the air, it's really hard to see the rim, so I'm just trying to put some ink on the rim so I can kind of see where the edge of the trephination is. And then we've cleaned it all off. <coughs> Then we're going to prepare our donor tissue. Sorry, the video is so crappy. It's just really old. But we have it stained with tripan blue. You can't really see it on this exposure. And uh, I just kind of scraped it a little bit, and then I wiped it off with a Wexo. And then we put the donor cornea minus SMAs, and then just sutured on. So it's 
very, the suturing is very similar. And that's awesome, but sometimes the next day, this is a picture of a double anterior chamber. So I didn't leave any air in this eye and you can see the donor tissue is thickened and that's the recipient decimates. But the good news is even without, I didn't even put an air bubble in this eye, I just waited. And this guy's like a nurse manager over at Primary Children's and he just reattached. Wasn't completely reattached at one week, but by two weeks he was. And he has really good vision. He's like 10 years out now. Um, this is a DSEC surgery. And again, I didn't really have any really short edited clips. So this is a little bit older surgery, older um, video. But we stripped SMAs. And this is really easy in Fuchs patients and can be really hard in pseudophagic corneal edema patients. Um, we've prepared the donor tissue by punching it. And then we're putting it on a little glide and we make it into a taco, taquito. It's kind of rolled up. And then we, we can put this through, you can put them through, you know, maybe a lot of people use injectors. This is called a Busan glide. But you can put it through a, uh, an injector. You can put it through about a three and a half millimeter incision. I usually make a four and a half millimeter incision. And you can, most of the time we have a chamber maintainer, but um, again, I think this was early enough in DSEC days. I didn't, wasn't using that. I was just having my assistant put fluid in, which actually works too. If you don't want to open up a FACO machine, you can. So anyway, a little painstaking. Put it in there. The nice thing about the glide is it's very easy to make sure that you don't flip it over. We don't usually mark DSEC tissue with S stamps. We're going to show you the DMEC here in a bit. But then once you get it in there and kind of get it centered, you just inflate it. Um, this step just, there's some venting incisions to try to remove the fluid from the interface. And just make sure it sticks well. Detachment rate is actually really low with DSEC with modern techniques, a little bit higher with DMEC. Again, there are tables and things in the book. So this is a, I don't know why the town is on This is Dr. Betts doing a, I didn't have a short DMEC video either, but a fellow a couple years ago with Dr. Lynn, so I just found this video. But there are some good videos in the links in the book, though. Too. It's just too hard to like try to put it all together in a picture. But you can see the S stamp there. This is um, a little bit earlier version of DMEX surgery where we are actually loading the tissue ourselves. It's very interesting how that S stamp is created. It's gentian violet dye. It's actually toxic to the endothelium. As you can imagine, you wouldn't stamp it right on the stamp it on the endothelium. Um, but they tree find a little, if any of you have an eye patient, they tree find a little hole in the anterior stroma and you can stamp it from the front and then replace that little, you can kind of see that on the I was like, I don't know you're so antsy to read right. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, it was programmed. Well, anyway, so we saw most of it. Um, so this is like your dream DMAC where it's in the eye and it's nice, loose fold. One or two taps and it opens up. But it's not always that easy, right? Yeah. Right. Eddie did her first two on um, last Wednesday. And she developed a new technique, but unfortunately <laughs> the camera was broken, so we don't have it. We had a constricted Maya call constricted pupil, and she was able to shoot that DMEC tissue into the pupil. <laughs> and uh, that took her out. It was awful. Oh, no. So um, there was a mistake in the book. It seems like yeah, there wouldn't be. But one of the tables said that um, for contraindications for um, PK donor tissue, that hepatitis C and hepatitis B surface antigen would have, it was a, just a dumb thing. So I don't know if you guys noticed that, but table 15.3, that little statement's wrong. It said uh, 
positive HIV and negative hepatitis surface antigen, whatever. So I still want to do some clinical conferences, hopefully this year. This is an ad for La Sportiva. We hike, I, four of my kids, I have five kids, one kid we come, but we hiked to the top of King's Peak. And we kind of all looked and said, hey, we all have La Sportivas on, let's take a picture and uh, see if we can sell it to the company. So it's our La Sportiva ad, so my financial disclosure. <laughs> We're also gonna do some Cornea Journal Clubs and we'll try to invite you guys. We don't really expect you to be there because we do most of them at Mid Valley, but they're usually pretty good. So thanks, any questions? Mm -hmm.